I'm Yaroslav, I work at Shopify, and today you will hear about our Apache Flink adoption story. So I'm a staff data engineer, and the big chunk of my career I spent building different uh, types of platforms, uh, but the last two years primarily focused on uh, stream processing. And so I had to include this slide about Shopify, you know, in case you don't know about us, we create the best commerce tools for anyone, anywhere to start and grow in business, and I have some interesting stats for you. Uh, like we have more than 1.7 million merchants in uh, roughly 175 countries. So uh, I wanna start today by telling you what I'm not going to cover. Uh, I'm not going to cover the pipeline. So I know this is very common when you, you know, adopt a new tool, you have uh, some kind of use case, you go through this journey, maybe you have some kind of set of data sources, event data, uh, databases, you uh, implement different transformations, different data processing, maybe write them to some kind of data store, serve the specific use case. Um, so you won't hear about that today. Um, the goal of my team uh, is different. So instead of building those data pipelines, those specific use cases, we actually wanna make building and operating Flink applications as easy as building and operating Rails applications. So why Rails? Uh, Shopify is a big Ruby and Rails shop, and Rails is also uh, well known for its you know, developer experience, uh, the ease of use. So it um, could be a stretch, but uh, we really wanted to try to make Flink as easy as Rails. And why exactly do we need to do that? So we have a lot of different use cases for uh, real-time data products at Shopify. So it's anything like product uh, analytics, reporting, data integration, um, data enrichment, sessionization, and all of those different domains, all of those different teams, you know, come to us, come to data platform and asking, you know, how can we build those? Um, and it's literally anyone from like, team that's supporting the core kind of sales functionality to inventory, marketing, billing, shipping, mobile teams, you name it. And so um, some can say, well, uh, you can probably have like a central team that uh, you know, can implement those pipelines, uh, but I'm also a big believer in data mesh and my interpretation of data mesh is really, you know, really strong ownership. So you actually want the engineers that work on billing to implement the transformations that are gonna be used uh, in the billing product potentially. You, you don't wanna separate those because you know, when you do, you have this different worlds of data folks and you know, engineering or operational uh, folks and uh, kind of the best products, the best results you get when you actually either embed data scientists or data engineers or teach uh, software engineers, backend engineer, engineers how to use data tools. So we, we truly believe in that. We're still going through that journey um, but, but I thought uh, this, is a, this is kind of a very good uh, explanation on you know, why, why I've been try to make it uh, easy to use. And why Apache Flink? So at Shopify, we uh, implemented a lot of different streaming applications over the years. We tried many technologies like Spark, structured streaming, Apache Beam with Google Dataflow, uh, some internal uh, products, but none of them um, you know, support really large um, uh, stateful, complex stateful transformations, and none of them feel just like building another application, like, like with Rails, right? Because Flink is complex, uh, streaming is complex, and, and you wanna eliminate as much complexity as possible. So how do you build a data platform? Um, I was thinking about this uh, for quite a while, and I ended up with this kind of three levels of platforms that you can build. So let me explain. Uh, the first one is not really a platform, but uh, I'm gonna mention it anyway. So um, you can use an open source tool like Apache Spark or Apache Flink. Um, you can add some libraries, tools, frameworks, uh, documentation, you know, customer support and whatnot. And you can leverage all of that to build standalone applications. Standalone applications that those domain teams will implement. And this is what I call an ecosystem approach. Um, so this is this is the first level. Um, we can go into the second level, which is you're starting um, to build a managed platform, uh, right? So a single shared managed, managed runtime that can power many use cases. So shared is a keyword here uh, and single is a keyword here, right? So if we're looking into those uh, analogies with open source, 
Um, maybe tools like uh, EMR from Amazon or Google Data Proc, they kind of fit this, uh, this paradigm where they abstract a lot of complexities. Um, you can perceive them as managed platform uh, and they can be used, like one you know, instance can be used to support many different use cases, so it is sure. And the third level is what I call serverless. Uh, you can notice quotes. Um, and what I really mean here, uh, when you take that managed uh, platform and you try to really uh, abstract and automate and simplify a lot of operational um, work, uh, eliminate a lot of toil, uh, you can try to get as, you know, as close as possible to the serverless paradigm. So for example, auto scaling you know, is something that is somewhat trivial nowadays with all the cloud tools and all the you know, Kubernetes um, uh, systems and stuff like that, but you know, try, try uh, auto scale Flink. You know, that's not as easy. And again, some of the examples in kind of vendor and open source um, here would be something like Google BigQuery, right, or Redshift Serverless, um, and those truly can abstract a lot of those uh, details. So BigQuery, you open the UI, you write a single SQL statement, you hit a button, it runs. You don't specify how many workers you need, you don't specify how many CPU, memory, disk size, all of that is abstracted. So this is kind of the serverless level. Um, so I wanna play a little game. Um, assuming you wanna build a platform, uh, raise your hand if you think you wanna build a managed platform number two. Anyone, I see one hand. Okay, who wanna build a serverless platform? I see more hands. Who wanna build an ecosystem? Uh, not a lot, okay. I, I expect that everyone, yeah, I see, I see you. <laughs> um, I expect that a lot of people will say serverless, right? Uh, the right answer, uh, of course, uh, it depends, it depends. It's always the answer. Uh, it depends because, you know, um, there are multiple dimensions here, uh, multiple angles to look at, and serverless is definitely, you know, kind of the coolest one. Um, but if you try to convince your boss that you need to spend, uh, you know, 18 months uh, designing and building and, you know, polishing this uh, managed serverless platform, well, good luck. Uh, it, it is justifiable, you can definitely build it, but it can be hard, even from, like, project management perspective and, you know, kind of uh, stakeholder alignment. And the ecosystem one, you know, probably something you can do in a few weeks, you take an open source project, you add some, some syndicate sugar, you add some tooling, um, and you kind of, you, you get going fairly quickly. Um, the, other as, the other aspect here is uh, the ease of use, right? So I, I mentioned BigQuery, where is the start, you write a SQL statement, you hit, hit the button, but that also means that people will create a lot of jobs, right, because it's so easy, right? So I can, uh, I can use dbt, something else, um, SQL, everybody understands, so I will end up with a lot of jobs, and you know, I constantly see this problem with um, people maybe writing a lot of jobs and occasionally, you know, rework happens or people leave, uh, jobs get abandoned, jobs break. Uh, there is not always that great data reliability set of uh, practices that we saw earlier today in every company. So that, that's a big problem. That's really a problem around ownership and the fact that you can easily implement things kind of make it a bit worse. And so with the ecosystem approach, for example, you can enforce it by actually uh, asking people, you know, you're gonna own that pipeline, that job that you implemented. So we're gonna provide you tools, we're gonna provide you infrastructure, we're gonna provide you maybe some frameworks, documentation, whatever you need. But in the end, you are on call. You are gonna be responding to 2 a.m. pages and um, you know, that can be scary and sometimes it needs some convincing, but in the end, that's really viable, and you suddenly don't have a lot of jobs that are abandoned or break all the time just because people get paged and people generally aware of what those jobs do and who, who is the owner. It's very clear. So uh, at Shopify, we decided, okay, let's go with the ecosystem approach because that's very easy to implement, and let's see if slowly we can evolve it to that serverless vision because this is where everyone wanna be. You probably wanna try to kind of skip that number two platform one um, as, as soon as possible just because you're not getting all of the benefits. You know, uh, one and three is where you wanna be. And the way we approached it, um, we ended up you know, the first milestone ended up just being really foundational, right? So we came up with a uh, very high level library that has a lot of uh, reusable components. 
For example, almost everyone needed to uh, read data from Kafka or write data to Kafka. Um, since we are running on uh, Google Cloud, we needed to interact with uh, cloud storage. Uh, also use Bigtable a lot for uh, user-facing products. And obviously it makes sense to just create all those connectors, battle test them, um, and package them in this library that everyone can use. So that's kind of a no-brainer situation. Uh, observability, you probably don't want people to you know, keep reinventing the way to monitor the same pipeline all the time. So we ended up implementing a custom metrics reporter, make sure the logs can be properly parsed, structured, and all of that. Uh, we also uh, created uh, a repo with a bunch of examples, right? So you wanna consume data from Kafka, do some processing, write it to Bigtable. Here's an example for you. So it's like a, a, um, uh, an application that you can run, you can run locally if you want to, and it's very easy to start using it as a foundation maybe for something for you. And we also ended up creating a project generator. Uh, I think it was mentioned yesterday during, during one of the talks. Uh, I believe um, Emily from MailChimp said that uh, the answer to their problem uh, for uh, you know, how to share GPUs was, well, let's just create a lot of, uh, you know, let's create a template and ensure people use templates to, to generate projects and that template abstracts a lot of complexity. And it works. And uh, yeah, I, I wanna, I want to vote again. Um, project generator is something that's super low effort. Uh, it needs some maintaining, but if you do maintain it, it can actually solve all the problems. So as a user, when you start working on a new project, you uh, use a tool, internal Shopify tool called Dev, which I'm gonna demo in a few slides, and you can get a working project um, in 30 seconds, which compiles, which has all the classes you need, all the dependencies, all the CI and CD tooling, observability, like all of that, local development, and it truly allows you to get going like in, in less than a day because you can run it on your laptop and you know, it's very fast. And obviously because we are supporting many, many, many customers uh, and we don't have a centralized platform yet, we invested a lot in documentation, customer support, um, and you know, any kind of support we can. Um, now we're on the second milestone where we're just launching those applications, learning, and iterating. And we'll see how that goes. Um, if you put together all those things that I mentioned, and it might be hard to read, I'm just realizing, but let me explain kind of how these things work together. So we actually started by developing a lot of those examples, like trying to understand what are the best practices, what do we feel people should be doing, and this is the green box at the bottom on the right. So we ended up writing a lot of those examples, kind of realized they look good enough. We want to standardize some of those things. So we created a template based on those examples. The template is integrated with this tool called dev. And when, when you type dev in it, uh, you get a little prompt that asks you a few questions. And in the end, you end up with this orange box, um, which is the project that's generated. So that thing is you know, it's compilable. Again, it has all those batteries included and you don't need to do much, you just run it. And finally, in order to not re-implement um, the same set of connectors or the same set of you know, functionality that's shared, um, we have that library and you see Trickle here mentioned all the time. So just to explain, Trickle is the internal name of that Flink ecosystem in Shopify. Uh, it doesn't mean anything uh, outside of Shopify, I guess. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the overall uh, structure of things. Uh, very scrappy, you can do it in a few weeks. And um, as long as you maintain all of those components, um, kind of things, things seem, to, seem to work, like this model seem to be working. And now you can ask me, so as a, as a user of this ecosystem, as, a, as an internal customer, what do I need to write actually, right? And where it leads? So, um, that library that I mentioned, uh, you can imagine it's like a top level of this sandwich, Flink sandwich, uh, that we have. We also provide infrastructure to all the customers. So we think uh, probably not, it's probably not reasonable to ask people to manage their own Kubernetes, right? So f fine, you won. So we're gonna manage infrastructure for you. We provide you with Kubernetes clusters, deployment tools, observ observability tools, like all of that. And in the end, as a customer, you focus on the business logic and you implement that Flink pipeline 
Um, and we're not trying to hide any of the Flink APIs. Like I think it's a mistake. Uh, I think Flink has APIs that are fairly straightforward and also powerful, so there is no reason for us to like put a DSL on top of that, but we are only trying to uh, provide very useful uh, components that can be shared. And so in the end, we have infrastructure, we have uh, application, business logic in the middle, and we have some higher level components at the top, that, that library. And now I hope this can work. Uh, just a quick demo of that dev tool. Um, literally just typing dev in it, in the terminal, um, then I'm gonna select a new trickle project. Um, then there's a bunch of SBT magic going on and uh, I'll be asked the name of the project I wanna create and the package name, kind of the main package. Um, that's it. We have the project ready and you will see just a bunch of files here, like fully, fully working SBT project with Docker file and all the other CI stuff. So just a quick demonstration. And so what's, what's inside that project? Um, we thought about this a lot, like how do we try to avoid enforcing a lot of uh, specific rules but show the best practices, right? And how do we explain how to think about streaming? Um, and this is, this is a typical uh, Flink application, Shopify, like the way it's structured. And I'm just gonna go through that and show you like a few different sections. So first, um, there is that trickle environment, and I, I promise that's the, the only abstraction on top of Flink. We're not hiding anything else. Uh, but uh, that just generates that streaming environment, and it does a lot of configuration for things like checkpointing and some of the other serialization uh, configuration. Then we ask the users to define their sources, right? Because it all starts with understanding the source. What am I consuming? Uh, in this case, uh, we have something called Monorail, uh, which is internal Shopify's um, Kafka message format, like event-based, and we also have a CDC one, so change, change data capture uh, format. So we define those two sources. Some of them can be in separate classes maybe because they're fairly complex, has a lot of business logic. Some of them can be defined in line, like the CDC one, All right? So you define your sources, using, you, you then define your syncs, like where is this data uh, going to? Uh, in this case, we have this kind of enum sync type, which you can change with an environment variable, uh, and you could decide between simply just printing data for uh, local development or debugging, or writing it to big table. Uh, in this case, that's like a production staging environment. So you define your, your syncs, and then you define your transformations. And um, I don't know, maybe this is coming from me reading Ken back very early, but. <laughs> really trying to be very clean at the high level and uh, try to express uh, those kind of fairly complex transformations with a few lines of code. And then when you go inside, you can kind of understand the, the details of the implementation. But uh, based on what you see now, you can understand we do some kind of post-processing on those two sources. Uh, we then join them and we aggregate the results of the join. And then we write them to the sync. Like that's, I guess, fairly straightforward to understand but if you wanna understand the specifics of those joins and aggregations, you kind of go inside those methods and uh, you can deep dive into that. So that's overall uh, how, we, uh, how we structure applications and how we try to educate uh, different users who may be coming to streaming, like that's, that's a, a viable uh, approach. Yeah, and that's just the same result. Um, just a quick snippet from documentation because I mentioned that CDC Kafka uh, source and I also mentioned you know we trying to be serious about docs so we have an internal um, you know data handbook um, documentation website and this is just like a quick snippet from that uh, where we have a bunch of links kind of and explaining how to use that source. Uh, I guess that's important for that ecosystem solution to be self-serve right so you, you don't want to be answering how to use that source every time you just get a snippet, done. So now I wanna uh, share some of the lessons we learned going through this journey. Um, the first one is we had to fork Apache Flink internally, and it sounds very scary, but it's not that scary in practice, believe me. Um, so why we had to fork it? Um, some of the features and early bug fixes, we just had to incorporate them as soon as possible. Uh, running Flink on GCP was hard a few major versions ago. 
um, just because um, you know it wasn't supporting things like writing to to GCS, for example, really well. Like you can try, um, but it's going to be a lot of debugging with Hadoop libraries and all of that. And in the end, uh, Flink has some kind of limitation. So we had to bring that uh, patch as early as possible. Things like Parquet Reader, uh, you know, before 114 had lots of issues. Things like big decimals, of course, microseconds, wasn't just dealing with those really well. Uh, and some things, yeah, they just don't work properly, like uh, Docstats D metrics reporter, had to implement a custom one, and uh, some, some other minor improvements. And I mentioned, you know, it's, it looks scary, but it shouldn't be um, that scary. Uh, and I wanted to show a couple of slides about how we maintain that fork, because I find it's very hard, you know, to uh, find these things online, like how big tech companies kind of maintain their uh, open source uh, Works. And this model works really well when you don't have a lot of active development, like you're not trying to stay close to, to main branch, but maybe you have like a handful of changes here and there, less than 10, let's say, uh, that you want to maintain. Um, and the way it works in our case is very simple. Every time a new major version of Flink releases, uh, they create a Git tag. The nice property of Git tags is they're immutable. So we create an internal branch in our, uh, in our fork uh, based on that tag, prefix Shopify, and then we can add a bunch of custom changes to that branch, build it. Um, if you want to contribute things upstream to, to the open source flank, you have all those commits available and you can, like, you can copy paste them. In practice, there's actually a third kind of repo in the middle, which is a public fork, where we copy things over first then create a PR against uh, the upstream. But what happens, uh, like the beauty of this model is what happens when there's a major release, new major release. So let's say 115 happened, there's a new git tag, you create a new branch, and um, it's as easy as cherry picking some of those commits from the previous branch to the new one, right? So uh, that works really well. We've done one of those major upgrades, and yeah, this seems to be working well, like this, this model. But as I said, in our case, we have kind of 10 or less custom changes. And then, of course, we have to build it. Uh, we have some CI jobs to build the artifacts, to build the uh, distribution of Flink, and then build the base Docker image that we kind of share and advertise uh, at Shopify that you, know, you should be using this Docker image instead of the public one. Uh, data reconciliation. So this is a bit orthogonal, but I thought I'm going to mention it just because there's a lot of talk about like data validation, data reliability in this conference. Uh, I think all of those, uh, all of those are important. Um, data reconciliation here is more about uh, data integrity reconciliation, not really data validation, because a lot of those uh, projects, projects that we see, they are migrations, right? So people migrating from batch jobs to streaming or people migrating from older streaming tools to Flink. And typically you have the new data set that you know, Flink generated and an old data set, maybe in, in, in the object store, maybe uh, in Kafka somewhere. And so you want to have a tool that can simply look at those two data sets and recon reconcile them, right? To see uh, you know, simple th things like counts. Do they even match? Do they have any data loss? Uh, and we have this kind of integrity check service that's running in background, but it can be as simple as just writing a couple of notebooks and literally comparing results. And this helps, this truly helps uncover some of the really tricky bugs because um, even if counts match, you know, maybe you're performing some aggregation and data is skewed or something. Um, yeah, so, so you need some kind of better, better integration, uh, integrity uh, test tools. Um, in order to scale this adoption, we actually needed to involve more than a single team, right? So I am part of that streaming capabilities team that maintains all those core components like the library, you know, tooling, infrastructure, deployment, all of that. And we needed to have a second team. So we actually have this internal customer success team and data platform at Shopify. And they act sort of as internal consultants. So they help us with, uh, you know, triaging some bugs and maybe escalating them only if needed, helping people with onboarding, 
uh, really acting as like consultants, almost like a solution architects internally and participating in technical designs with customers and uh, why glowing first key customers? Because you need to get that initial adoption, like you need to get those initial first few customers that you can then show to everyone that, hey, I actually have adoption, right? So that's important. And um, I think it, it would be very hard for us to you know, just be a single platform team trying to, uh, trying to provide all those tools and uh, you know, customer adoption is something that's critical. Again, just because we are not implementing a central managed runtime, which you know takes care of some of those concerns, but we are trying really to shift that focus to the application developers, um, and yeah, they ask a lot of questions, and you should be ready with your documentation, with your self-serve tools, and potentially a team of you know consultants, I guess. Uh, of course, you know it works for bigger companies, but even in small companies, you can have just a handful of people occasionally wearing that solution architect hat and helping, you know, if you're following kind of um, the same approach. Build a community, so that uh, was very important too, we realized, and uh, you know, we have of course things like internal q &A website where people just go and ask questions, we have a bunch of Slack channels, but the interesting one is this, uh, you know, meetups that we created. So regular um, meetups for Flink users, all those internal teams in the company, they, uh, you know, meet up every month, they share different use cases, they build different pipelines, learn from each other, and you know, as, as a platform team, we don't need to do much in this case. We just kind of, we need to avoid uh, you know, interfering. People, people uh, you know, smart, they, um, they know what to share and kind of uh, learn from each other. So um, that, that's been very helpful. So as a result, um, in less than six months, we had three very large use cases in production and uh, 10 plus prototypes running. And I presented about one of those prototypes uh, at Flink Forward last year. Uh, and there is also a, an article in our blog about how we implemented Black Friday, Cyber Monday live map uh, with Flink. Uh, and part of that map was actually in New York on Times Square on a billboard. Uh, during Black Friday, uh, and that billboard was powered with Flink, which is kind of nuts, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that, that's a cool use case, so check check out that, uh, that blog post if you're interested. Uh, in terms of next steps, you can ask, you know, we, we've done this first milestone, we're somewhat successful, we got some adoption. Um, of course, our initial, uh, sorry, our final goal would be that serverless runtime, for sure. Um, I guess we understand the importance, and uh, the plan for us is to try to reuse all those building blocks uh, that we have now, or you know, still building. So for example, we really wanna focus on production maturity, right? We provide infrastructure, we provide deployment tooling, we wanna make it much, much better. Um, we, we wanna have auto-scaling, you know, Flink now has auto-scaling for the last few major versions. Uh, I guess it's still, still kind of annotated as MVP, uh, but uh, I think it's ready for prime time. Uh, and things like zero downtime deployments, like those are really hard to implement with streaming because it all depends on the data syncs, right? Where the data is coming uh, to and, you know, it's very different um, in different applications. So it's hard to have that kind of central, um, central way of zero downtime, but uh, I think we found something, something interesting. Um, and also focusing on new features, right? So we recently updated to the new latest version of Flink, 114, 115 I think is coming or already released, so we'll need to upgrade again. Uh, but we got this really nice abstraction called hybrid source. Uh, and if, you, if you're still skeptical about CAP architecture, for example, uh, Google Flink hybrid source. And I hope that's gonna be uh, a bit more convincing because it allows you to combine your historical data on like S3, for example, with a live topic in Kafka. Very seamlessly from, from the uh, Flink perspective. So you just define two sources and you tell how to initialize the Kafka topic based on what offsets or what timestamps, and it just works. Uh, feels like magic. Uh, Python support, like all of that um, work we've done using Scala API, and um, I thought we're gonna be <laughs> uh, seeing some resistance, uh, but surprisingly, you know, people who haven't touched JVM uh, before, you know, they were kind of very excited about this, and you know, Scala that you write in like Spark or Flink is very different from Scala that you would write in like a backend service with you know, cats or some other very functional libraries. So um, 
Scala is not that scary, it's not that hard if you are just building those data applications and literally just trying to use um, Flink APIs, right? Not, not trying to invent anything, anything too hard. Um, and we also work on a bunch of integration. So Iceberg, yes, that's the uh, choice uh, that Shopify made for data formats and uh, Flink and Iceberg, uh, they have very nice integration, but also a lot more integrations coming uh, for us, uh, integrations with internal um, set of tools and more. And to summarize, um, just like a few key learnings I wanted to take away, um, I presented you different approaches, kind of how to think about this platform building exercise, and the answer is always it depends, so choose carefully. Um, the typical strategy that works really well for, for me, for example, is always building the foundation first and engaging a bunch of early customers and just iterating from there, not trying to foresee what people will need in like 12 months, because that usually doesn't work. Uh, sometimes you have to have more control over that key technology that you're adopting. So for example, forking Flink was a necessary evil, you can say, um, but in the end it worked, worked out pretty well. Uh, we created a community and we basically had to spend a lot of time with those first key customers and really show them the value of the SECA system, but once we get them, like it became very easy to convince everyone uh, after that. And uh, you know, keep iterating, focus on the biggest gaps. This is what we're trying to do right now, I guess, uh, by uh, really understanding the strength of the uh, offering and uh, working on the gaps. And that's it, I'm happy to answer your questions. You can hit me up on Twitter, and of course, we are hiring. Thank you. <laughs>